Hello and welcome everybody. I'm gonna give it one or two minutes until all of our attendees are here with us and I'm gonna start the webinar. Just a few more moments until everybody's in. Thank you all for joining. Hello, if you just joined, I'm just going to give it a few more minutes until everyone's on and I'm going to start the webinar. Welcome. Okay, it's 102, and with that, hello and welcome to today's Better Buildings webinar. In this series, uh, Better Buildings and DOE laboratory scientists will be providing updates on relevant research and technology, addressing frequently asked questions by building op buildings operators, identifying opportunities to enhance energy efficiency, and discussing lesson learns from the pandemic to build resiliency. I'm your moderator, Mariana Ejea Casalduc, I'm an ORISE Science Technology and Policy Fellow with the Commercial Buildings Integration Team in the Building Technologies Office. I'm also the new healthcare sector lead with the Better Buildings Program. Thank you all for being with us today. We, ha we have a wonderful session prepared and a fantastic speaker we're going to introduce in just a moment. But before we dive in, I'd like to go over some brief housekeeping rules. First, you have joined on a muted line. All questions for our speakers will go through Slido. We will show you how to submit questions in a moment. If you are having any trouble with your GoToWebinar features, please chat our technical support using the chat function. Please note today's session is being recorded and will be made available on the Better Buildings Solution Center. So, as I mentioned, we're excited to announce that today we will be using an interactive platform called Slido for polling and Q&A. Please go to www.slido using your mobile device or by opening a new window in your internet browser. Today's event code is hashtag DOE. If you would like to ask our panelists any questions, please submit them at, through, at any time throughout the presentation, and we will be answering your questions near the end of the session. You can select the thumbs up icon for questions that you like, which will result in the most popular questions moving to the top of the queue. Now, we're going to start things off with a few poll questions so we can learn more about you. Please join us over at Slido to respond. And I'm going to give everyone just a couple of seconds to answer each question. So which sector do you represent? Healthcare, commercial real estate, higher education, K through 12, retail, food service and grocery, hospitality, multifamily housing, data centers, residential, state and local governments, or a federal government or national lab. Okay. Thank you all so much for responding. I think we can move to the next poll. That might be too short, yeah. Okay, the next question, did you consider or conduct building commissioning or retuning as a first step? Please answer yes or no. I'm gonna give you guys a little bit more time. Thank you for responding. Okay, I think we can move to the next poll. 
Are you using fault detection and diagnostics to track the problems and the persistence of your changes? This is a yes or no question. Awesome. I think we can move to the next poll. Have you adopted the measures that, now check all of the measures that, that apply, promote social distancing and face coverings, measures that increase outdoor and air ventilation rates, increase filtration using HVAC systems, install additional filtration and ventilation equipment or other? You can type in an answer for other if you wish to do so. Okay. I think we can move on to the next one. What is the greatest challenge to bring occupants back into buildings? Insufficient knowledge and guidance, shifting knowledge and guidance, insufficient trained staff to adjust building operations, the cost to implement indoor air quality measures or other? And you can type in an answer for other. Thank you all so much for answering. Okay, I think we can go on to the next poll. This is an open answer. Which topics would you like to be discussed during future webinars? Okay, thank you so much for submitting your answers. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you everyone for answering our polls. With that, let's move into the presentation portion of today's session. I'd like to introduce Marcus Bianchi, Senior Research Engineer at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Marcus is going to introduce the Space Condition Conditioning Technology Research Team. Marcus? Yes. Good. Hi. I, I, good morning. Good afternoon. Um, the Space uh, Conditioning um, Research Team is uh, myself, uh, Michael Deru, and Greg Shukas. Um, we uh, conduct uh, research uh, supporting better buildings, the Better Buildings Alliance. Um, in the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we have a resource. I'm, I'm going to be really brief. 
Um, if you if you want to know more information, if you go to Better Buildings Alliance uh, website, you can find the space conditioning team. But one particular resource that I would like you to to know about is the HVAC resource map that is uh, uh, available, and uh, and uh, the address is on the screen. And I don't want to take much of your time because I, I think Professor Bill Bentleff will be um, you know will probably use all the time properly. Thank you so much, Mariana. Thanks for being on the line with us today, Marcus. Now I'm going to introduce today's presenter. William Banfleth is a professor of architectural engineering at the Pennsylvania State University in University Park, Pennsylvania, where he has been employed since 1994. Previously, he was a senior consultant for CBA Inc. in Cincinnati, Ohio, and a principal investor at the US Army Construction Engineering Research Laboratory in Champaign, Illinois. He holds a BS, MS, and PhD degrees in mechanical engineering from the University of Illinois, where he also earned a Bachelor of Music degree in instrumental performance. He is a registered professional engineer. He is the author or co-author of more than 170 technical papers and articles and 14 books and book chapters. He consults on the design of chilled water thermal <laughs> storage systems and has been involved in more than 20 projects worldwide. Dr. Banfleth is a fellow of ASHRAE, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and the International Society for Indoor Air Quality and Climate. He has served ASHRAE in a variety of capacities, including student branch advisor, chapter governor, technical committee, and standing committee chair, and as director at large, vice president, treasurer, and 2000 to 2000, 2013 to 2014 society president. As a reminder, please send in questions for our panelists through Slido by going to slido.com and typing in the event GOAT hashtag DOE, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can at the end. At this point, I'd like to pass things off to Dr. Banfleth. Dr. Banfleth, are you ready to screen share? Do you have everything up? I'm ready to go. Thank you. Floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Are we, we're good? Right, well, uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you may be to everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be <clears throat> back to give you an update on uh, the presentation that I made last May. A lot of uh, things have happened in the world of COVID-19 HVAC guidance, and uh, the purpose today is to give you uh, a summary of where we are. So let's briefly, uh, at the beginning, uh, review how all of this got started, and I'll try to do that quickly so we can focus on uh, the current status. Uh, if we went back to, to last March or April, one of the uh, the key questions at that time was, is COVID-19 uh, an airborne uh, disease? Is uh, airborne transmission possible? And then you will recall that at that time, WHO and CDC and other public health groups were uh, not very uh, supportive of the idea that this might be an airborne disease. But on the other hand, ASHRAE and, and RIVA uh, both came out early on with statements that we thought there was enough likelihood of airborne transmission that uh, we should take precautions against it. And um, this is essentially applying what's called the precautionary principle that, that uh, if there's a serious plausible threat, then we ought to protect ourselves against it. And the reason for drawing that conclusion at the time was that we had already uh, a number of case studies that suggested very strongly airborne transmission, the Diamond Princess cruise ship incident and the Skagit Valley uh, Washington choir practice, <clears throat> and perhaps most notably the Guangzhou uh, restaurant incident that has been very widely discussed. So this was <clears throat> perhaps the, the strongest indication of airborne transmission. It was a restaurant uh, where there had been uh, nine infections from one uh, pre-symptomatic infected person over a period of an hour, an hour and a half, and an investigation of the uh, uh, restaurant determined that there was no mechanical ventilation supplied and that the air change rate due to leakage was less than one liter per second per person. And uh, there was uh, no close contact observed on video. So the, the conclusion from this seemed to be that the low ventilation rate had contributed to airborne transmission. There was also an effect from uh, the air circulation patterns caused by the HVAC system. So uh, that was why we 
answer that question affirmatively. The second question was, the HVAC system spread COVID-19? And you may remember that ASHRAE uh, published the statements shown here that said that uh, HVAC systems could be protective uh, in terms of dealing with airborne infections and that it wasn't a good idea to turn them off as some were suggesting at the time. Uh, we were fairly uh, unequivocal about that statement back then. I think we've learned some things about air distribution since then that uh, might make us qualify it a little bit. So if we went back to last May, what uh, one would point to as ASHRAE's guidance for COVID-19 came primarily from the uh, airborne infectious diseases physician document, which is now called infectious aerosols. It was uh, republished in, in April of uh, 2020. So this uh, document was generic. It didn't refer specifically to, to COVID-19 and it wasn't actually written to be a guidance document. And the uh, control measures that were discussed in it were very conservative uh, and other considerations like energy use and cost were not really covered. Uh, so this was guidance at one point, but it uh, should be understood that this has been superseded by task force guidance that's been published since then. So the initial guidance that ASHRAE put out, which was uh, pretty similar to what other similar organi organizations did, is summarized here. Increase outdoor air uh, flow as much as possible. Disable demand controlled ventilation systems because they reduce ventilation. Uh, improve filtration to, to MERV 13 or the highest level that's, that's possible. Operate systems 24-7. Uh, add in-room air cleaners if they're deemed necessary. Add uh, UVGI if, if that's deemed to be necessary. And bypass energy recovery systems because of concern about reentry. Um, and consider controlling temperature and humidity ranges to reduce viral survival time. I've, I've highlighted a few things in that list that contribute to increased energy use in buildings. So that's where we were. Let's uh, now jump forward to the present and uh, to the current situation. So finally, um, at the beginning of October, both uh, WHO and uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention acknowledged that there was potential for airborne transmission of COVID-19 in some circumstances, although the uh, position remains that close contact large droplet transmission is the most common and uh, they have not yet completely abandoned the notion of uh, intermediate surface or fomite transmission, but uh, both organizations at, uh, at that time published statements that indicated that in enclosed spaces with uh, prolonged contact and with inadequate ventilation, uh, there could be airborne transmission. So that was a big step forward because it removed a perceived uh, disagreement between organizations that were providing HVAC guidance and these public health authorities. Uh, nevertheless, there's still an ongoing discussion and a lot of uh, clarifications being made. Uh, the, the paper that is shown on this slide was just published within the last week and we're still trying to address some of the uh, misunderstandings about what airborne or aerosol transmission is that exists between uh, epidemiologists and aerosol scientists and engineers. But for the most part, that argument has been resolved. So one of the things that happened between the issuance of the first ASHRAE guidance in the April May time frame and the present was that uh, people actually started using it and uh, a lot of feedback came in. So uh, this is a summary of I think some of the, the most important comments. One was simply that uh, many in the public were glad to have recommendations from ASHRAE, but there were a lot of, of questions that indicated some confusion or the need for refinement. Do we have to do all the things that are on this list that I showed you before? Um, what if I can't do some of them? Does that mean that I can't be safe in my building? Uh, what is the specific justification for each of the things that have been recommended? Uh, what were the recommendations based on uh, cost benefit analysis or are you just telling us to do things without uh, concern for what the cost might be? Similar question with respect to energy use. Was energy 
impact considered. Um, and many have been concerned that uh, these recommendations will somehow become the, the new standard after the pandemic is over. And uh, the other question, which I've already addressed, was why, why should we do this if WHO and uh, CDC say that there uh, is no airborne transmission? So those uh, helped to form some of the uh, later developments of guidance, as did some research. So uh, we, we did find, um, thanks to a study done by the University of Oregon, that uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus does penetrate through HVAC systems. This was something that was widely disputed initially, that there wasn't any evidence that uh, the virus made it through. Now here was uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus on particles that had gone through an air handling unit, including a, a MERV 15 filter. So that uh, is no longer the question. And another question was, is there live virus in the air? And uh, we've had a study published within the last several months that uh, demonstrated that there is active uh, virus in aerosols that can be sampled from uh, indoor spaces. So a lot of the uh, uh, suppositions that went into the initial precautionary principle approach have been confirmed by later developments. And there's more that uh, we could talk about, but not in the time available. So uh, what I'd like to get into is a, a review of the current status of guidance. And I want to do that by focusing on what uh, ASHRAE is calling its core recommendations. Uh, when, when we started writing guidance, uh, we had 15 teams that were producing guidance for different occupancies, for commercial and uh, residential and, and healthcare. And, and they uh, rather quickly accumulated something approaching 400 pages of guidance. And with everyone working on the same task somewhat independently, um, at the same time, uh, it got to be a little bit confusing. There were some differences across guidance for different types of, of facilities, and it wasn't so clear to, to readers of these documents exactly what was being asked. So what we tried to do was to boil things down into a compact set of, of recommendations that uh, summarized what was in the more detailed guidance. And these were approved by the ASHRAE task force on uh, January 4, and they're now published on the ASHRAE website. So I'm going to uh, go through these for you briefly. They, they serve a, an inward-facing purpose, as I noted, to ensure that we're consistent across all of our different pieces of guidance, and the outward-facing purpose is to communicate to uh, the public in a concise way uh, the basics of risk reduction and what the current state of ASHRAE guidance is, because as guidance has changed over time, it's become a problem uh, to identify exactly what is being recommended now. So the first core recommendation is not even related to HVAC, it's follow public health guidance. Uh, distancing and use of masks indoors is highly important, and particularly um, use of, of masks. Um, we need distancing because COVID-19 is transmitted by multiple modes and we need masks to help uh, inhibit uh, close range transmission. But very importantly, they also reduce the amount of aerosol emission. So if everyone is wearing masks and there happen to be infected people in a, a space, they're going to put less viral aerosol into the air and the mask that others are wearing will somewhat reduce the amount that they inhale, which is uh, as important and as effective as some of the most stringent HVAC control measures. So that's the starting point. Mask uh, use is very important. The, the second uh, point has to do with ventilation, filtration, and, and air cleaning. And this may be the, uh, uh, the one of central interest for most. Uh, we initially had uh, this 24, or excuse me, this as much as possible outdoor air uh, recommendation that many were making. And uh, after looking at uh, all of the considerations that go into developing a package of controls, uh, it was decided that uh, we should instead be recommending that at least minimum outdoor air per code or applicable standard be provided. Uh, so uh, meet your minimum code or meet ASHRAE standard 62.1, whatever it is. Uh, 
So this is important because the early guidance that was put out recommended maximizing outdoor airflow, which raised concerns about uh, energy use. And uh, as we thought about other controls that were available, the, the task force came to the uh, point of view that other controls could be as effective and have lower uh, energy impact than increasing uh, outdoor airflow. And we need to have minimum ventilation because this is providing air quality control for other contaminants. <clears throat> but it's important to note that minimum outdoor air does not uh, guarantee good protection from airborne infection. We're simply saying that um, you don't need to exceed that, but you should be at least at that level. With respect to filtration, the uh, core recommendation is to use combinations of filters and air cleaners that achieve MERV 13 or better performance for recirculated air. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this addresses um, the uh, issue that uh, first of all, minimum standard filters, MERV 6 or 8 are not effective for infectious aerosol uh, particles. The small particles are not well controlled by those filters. And it also um, addresses the uh, concern that HEPA filters might be necessary. They, they aren't in, in our opinion, and uh, they're also a, a difficult and expensive retrofit. So MERV 13 is recommended because it has good efficiency for respiratory aerosols without being uh, an impossible retrofit for a lot of air handling units. And by uh, noting that combinations of filters and air cleaners could be used to achieve that level of performance, opens the door for a way to comply, even if it's found that uh, a straight MERV 13 filter change out isn't possible. So if you have two stages of filtration, it's possible to do it with somewhat lower efficiency filters or air cleaners could be used to supplement the performance of a particulate filter. The reason that MERV 13 filters are recommended is uh, emphasized in this figure. It shows on the left the uh, distribution of respiratory droplet sizes and overlaid on it the three uh, size ranges for particles in which MERV rated filters are, are rated. And you can see from the table on the right that a MERV 8 filter uh, has no minimum requirement for 0.3 to 1 micron particles and only 20% for uh, 1 to 3 micron particles. MERV 13 is 50% and 85% minimum efficiency in those ranges, which is where a lot of the uh, particles are going to reside. <clears throat> With respect to other um, air cleaners, there's a statement in the core recommendations that uh, only air cleaners for which evidence of effectiveness and safety is clear should be used. Uh, that's important because there are many air cleaners, air purifiers, they're called by different names uh, in the marketplace, for which we don't have well-established proof of uh, manufacturers' claims of efficacy or safety. Uh, ASHRAE currently still only identifies uh, ultraviolet germicidal radiation as having a high level of evidence of effectiveness behind it and uh, uh, safety as well. So until those issues are resolved, uh, users are, are uh, strongly encouraged to uh, make sure that they've pre been presented with good evidence that an air cleaner will work and is safe. Uh, the next uh, core recommendation with respect to ventilation, filtration, and air cleaning is about combining controls. And I think this may be uh, the most important single item, which is that uh, uh, we should select control options, including filters and air cleaners, to achieve the desired exposure reductions while minimizing associated energy penalties. What this recommendation is saying is that uh, it's not necessary to uh, increase outdoor air by a huge amount to reduce exposure indoors if you can do it by some other means that might be uh, less expensive or less energy intensive. Uh, so now we have a way of optimizing for a particular uh, application the available controls. Uh, it's 
uh, consistent with uh, what we're calling an equivalent clean air delivery rate approach, we need values for what those targets are. That's something that's being worked on right now. But to illustrate where uh, those values of equivalent clean air uh, supply rate can come from, uh, we'll look at the Wells Riley model, which uh, was unknown to most before the pandemic. And now uh, everyone seems to have some understanding of it. To uh, refresh our memories, it relates the probability of infection to the uh, rate of generation of infectious doses by infectors and by the amount of infectious aerosol that's inhaled by susceptibles. All of, both of those increase risk of infection and risk of infection decreases in proportion to the flow rate of uncontaminated air. So this equation, if we can fill in the parameters, gives us a way of determining a, a clean air flow rate that's consistent with the desired level of risk. And then if we can represent the performance of air cleaners in terms of equivalent clean air delivery, we have an approach that can be used to optimize the uh, infection controls subject to other constraints. So we can do this for, for uh, COVID-19, but do need to point out that we don't know the infectious quanta production rates that are needed in the uh, Wells-Riley model very accurately. So the uh, chart on the left here shows infectious quanta emission rates estimated by probably the best source available, this paper by Bonanno et al. And uh, it clearly shows that there is a, a different emission rate for different respiratory activities, uh, lower for, for uh, light breathing, more for speaking, uh, even more for singing or shouting or some other activity. But uh, note the wide range in uh, accuracy of these estimates between the, the fifth percentile, the 95th percentile, we have two order, orders of magnitude of uh, values of quanta for a, a particular activity. And as we can see in the figure on the, uh, the right, the sensitivity of infection risk to the quanta production rate is very strong. It's actually stronger than uh, the, the sensitivity to ventilation rate. So uh, having an appropriate value of, of quanta in this uh, analysis is important. And we're simply doing what we can with the data that's available. I think that this figure also indirectly shows us the importance of wearing masks. If we, you uh, consider what would happen if you could cut the quanta emission rate by 50% for any one of these values, uh, it makes a, a quite significant impact on probability of infection. So how can we use this? We can take the Wells-Riley equation, and if we want to represent the performance of air cleaners and filters in terms of clean air changes, we can uh, introduce air changes as a variable, or we can keep it in terms of uh, actual airflow. So if we want to put uh, an air cleaner into a space, uh, and we know that it has a clean air delivery rate of a certain amount based on having been uh, tested, we can calculate what that equivalent air change rate is of clean air, and then uh, it can be added to the actual outdoor air uh, ventilation rate to determine the overall impact on risk of infection. And so, as I say, we can do this with other uh, types of, of controls as well. So having determined what our total um, non-infectious airflow rate needs to be, we can meet that total with a, a sum of outdoor air and uh, cleaned air from filters, cleaned air from air cleaners, and can also take into account even uh, mechanisms like deposition and inactivation as a result of uh, temperature and humidity effects uh, to get the total. Another area where we have a recommendation is uh, is air distribution, and uh, only a couple of things here. One is that uh, where it's not specifically called for, for some reason, uh, directional airflow should be avoided and mixing 
should be preferred and that we should avoid strong air currents that have the potential to uh, blow uh, infectious aerosol from person to person in the space. Now, the reason this is important is that uh, there is research that shows that stratified ventilation, for example, from underfloor or displacement systems can trap infectious aerosols um, in the occupied zone where uh, they might be breathed and actually increase risk. And we've seen that strong drafts can also transmit infections over long distances. Uh, here's some evidence of that. A recent case study that was published is from uh, investigation of a, an incident in a restaurant in Korea. There was an infected person who was dining there and uh, three people were infected while that person was um, in the, the restaurant, the dining companion, which is not surprising. But interestingly, two others who were uh, something like six to eight meters away. And uh, it was found by looking at cell phone records that one of them was only in the space five minutes with the infected person. The other one was there 20 minutes. <clears throat> and the uh, mode of infection seems to be long range droplet caused by air flows from the, the VRF system. So we had two VRF cassettes here putting out pretty high air flows and along this axis from the infector to the susceptibles who became infected, there was a, an air velocity of as high as 1.2 meters per second, which is uh, five to 10 times higher than what you would expect in a, uh, an overhead mixing ventilated space the way they're typically designed. And in the figure on the, the right, we can see this uh, problem of stratification in a displacement uh, ventilation situation. This comes from a, a article in the ASHRAE Journal from a few years ago that looked at uh, healthcare applications of displacement ventilation. Uh, there's also a recommendation with respect to uh, humidity and, and temperature. Uh, we've seen good evidence uh, in research done by the Department of Homeland Security that uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus is uh, sensitive to, to both temperature and humidity, that uh, higher temperature and higher humidity to a point uh, both seem to reduce the uh, lifetime of active virus substantially. And so that's documented, um, but the recommendation that ASHRAE has put forward is to maintain temperature and humidity design set points. Uh, Riva has put it a little more bluntly to say that uh, uh, temperature and humidity have no effect on infection risk. That may be uh, an exaggeration, but uh, we believe that, that um, we need to look at the total risk of infection. And although uh, inactivation has some effect on reducing the risk of infection, if we consider the, the total of uh, deposition and ventilation and filtration together with the impact on uh, lifetime of viruses, it may not be as significant as thought. And that's indicated by uh, this influenza uh, data produced by Lindsay Marr at Virginia Tech, where we have uh, quite large variation in inactivation rate as humidity varies, but not such a large difference in the overall inactivation rate. Uh, so the, the reasons we, we believe this is the right recommendation is that uh, the effect of humidity doesn't seem to be as significant as other controls. And when you add to that the fact that it can be costly and, and potentially risky to humidify some buildings that don't have it, um, it, uh, it seems like a strong recommendation to humidify is not justified. There are also some recommendations that relate to uh, what we've called HVAC system operation. Uh, the, the first is to maintain the uh, equivalent clean air supply, ventilation plus filtration plus air cleaners that are required for design occupancy when anyone is present in, uh, in a space served by the system. So this says that when people are there, we should provide uh, full uh, protection, but um, obviously does not indicate that it's necessary to do that when someone isn't there. So this is the recommendation that implicitly discourages 
the use of demand controlled ventilation, um, but it also <clears throat> uh, underscores the importance of ventilating whenever someone's in the building. We can't simply call uh, occupied hours when the normal workforce goes home. It has to cover when uh, maintenance and uh, janitorial staff are in the building as well. Uh, there's also a recommendation on uh, flushing of spaces between occupancy periods. Uh, originally, uh, this was uh, the 24-7 operating recommendation, we're going to flush the building continuously, and uh, we changed that to two hours uh, before and after occupancy at some point. Uh, but now consistent with this notion that we can take credit for filtration and air cleaning, and also uh, by establishing a goal of 95% reduction uh, by uh, engineering controls, we can greatly reduce the amount of time that system needs to operate in order to, to clear a space. So uh, this is important because we may need to con clear residual contamination between occupancies. A good example of that would be class changeovers at uh, a school or a university. Um, and uh, we wanna make it clear that you don't need to operate systems all the time. So it's important for that reason as well. And the, uh, the recommendation for three air changes is based on uh, the behavior of a well-mixed space uh, for which three air changes will reduce an initial concentration by 95%. If you want to go to 99% uh, clearance, then that takes five air changes. But we're neglecting other mechanisms here. So um, this seems to be a, a good level of, of reduction prior to reoccupancy. I mentioned uh, earlier the uh, initial recommendation to turn off energy recovery wheels because of potential reentry. So the the core recommendation at this point is that that sort of device should be evaluated uh, to determine whether it can be operated. Because uh, after studying the uh, the risk further, it became clear that there were many energy recovery wheels for which operation was perfectly safe and the important thing is to identify ones that that have uh, issues that have to do with the pressure relationships based on how the fans are uh, installed in the system uh, so that uh, they can either be disabled or uh, remediated so they can be operated. And this again is a, a measure that will allow us to continue saving as much energy as possible in systems even while we're putting in controls to reduce infection risk. The reentry uh, through energy recovery wheels is not the only uh, concern. We have reentry from other sources as well. There have been two pretty recent studies that uh, have uh, identified this as a problem. One is from a, a Korean uh, hotel, uh, not a hotel, but a, an apartment building, multifamily residence, in which it appears that uh, infections were transmitted through plumbing, much like the MY Gardens. Uh, case for the original SARS outbreak in, in Hong Kong. So here we had a, a number of individuals who were infected in this apartment building. Uh, there was no evidence that there was any kind of uh, close contact or fomite transmission. And all of the infected individuals were on the same plumbing stack. So it was uh, just as in the, the MI Gardens case, uh, a matter of someone using a toilet who was infected it was fecal shedding of active virus, produced an aerosol in the plumbing stack. And because there were traps that were dry in other apartments, then uh, air from the vent stack could re-enter those apartments and cause infections. And we've also seen in a more recent uh, case study that was published, uh, again, vertically aligned infections in an apartment building. But in this case, all of the apartments were connected to natural ventilation shafts that uh, tied into the, the bathrooms. And, and because of stack effect, uh, and this being a, a naturally ventilated building, air could flow uh, not only into those shafts, which were not being mechanically depressurized, but it could flow out as well. So there were a number of infections up and down this 
shaft, uh, presumably for that reason. One more recommendation is that systems should be commissioned. So verify that HVAC systems are functioning as designed. Uh, I think we all know why this is important. I'm glad the question was asked at the beginning of the uh, webinar here. Many systems are poorly maintained, uh, and by many, that means really uh, a lot. The uh, graphic on the right-hand side comes from the uh, GAO report on U.S. schools that was published last year. They found that 41% of U.S. school districts had 50% or more of their HVAC systems that uh, needed repair or replacement. And they also found a lot of problems with uh, windows in those bin buildings as well. So uh, these are problems that have significant uh, uh, possibility of increasing infection risk. And they also would tend to increase the energy use of buildings. So uh, if uh, buildings are, are commissioned, if HVAC systems are commissioned, it will likely make them both safer and reduce their energy use. So that in a nutshell is the, the current ash rate position, which is uh, mostly congruent with what Riva and other uh, guidance publishing organizations are doing. Uh, to summarize, in, back in May 2020, our, our guidance was very conservative, it was unprioritized, it was semi-quantitative. Uh, we took on board a lot of feedback and uh, reviewed what we were doing and were able to make some improvements that addressed issues of economics and uh, energy use. Uh, this all centers around using quantitative risk models. That's uh, a, a developing uh, methodology, but it seems to be the way we need to go. So we, we now have guidance that's more flexible, uh, less conservative, but still focuses on uh, risk reduction. Uh, mask use, to reiterate, is uh, perceived as being more important now than it ever was. The more uh, we look at the impact of masks on indoor transmission, the more it seems that they uh, really uh, ought to be considered uh, mandatory. If not mandated, then uh, we as individuals should really uh, make a point of wearing them. The, the highest priority to conclude uh, for, for ASHRAE is uh, making specific recommendations about equi equivalent clean air supply rates to support the uh, approach that we're promoting. There are some that have been recommended, uh, but we're still working on our own, and uh, the sooner we can get those out, the better. I don't have a date for you, but uh, I think we should have something that's available for uh, use by the public fairly soon. And with that, I'll uh, conclude and uh, uh, recommend that if you haven't been there, you go to the ashray.org slash COVID-19 webpage and uh, see all the latest guidance. Uh, in addition to the detailed guidance and the core recommendations, you'll find a lot of uh, useful one-page summaries that we've put up as well that have tried to make this uh, information more accessible. And with that, I will uh, conclude and um, ready for the Q&A. Awesome. Thank you for sharing, Dr. Bamfleth. Uh, that was a great presentation. At this time, we'll begin taking questions from the audience. Um, so let's transition to Slido. I'm going to be starting from the top. And if I don't get to your question, don't worry. We can um, connect you with Dr. Bamfleth and our team later, and we can get those questions answered. So the first question we have on top with four upvotes is how can you find information on the right combination of filters that would achieve MERV 13? Yeah, that's a uh, uh, an interesting question because the, the MERV rating itself only gives you uh, three data points if you can get them from the manufacturer. All, all you know is what the minimum efficiency across those three ranges is going to be. Um, we have a filtration and disinfection team uh, on the ASHRAE task force, and, and they're working on, on that very issue right now. So um, I have to say it's, it's kind of difficult to do, but we recognize that it's important and uh, should be producing some, some guidance on how to do that, because this all goes along with this uh, approach of, of uh, defining how you can actually implement this equivalent uh, non-infectious airflow methodology. Thanks for answering. If I were going to do it myself, just to add a little more to that, I, I suppose that 
I would be conservative and use the minimum ratings in, in each of the three uh, filter size ranges and, and then combine that with the, the, the typical aerosol size range distribution. And, and from that, you can, can uh, calculate from the MER 13 requirements, 50, 85, 90, uh, what would get through and, and then you could uh, calculate that for another filter. For an air cleaner, it's simple. Uh, you, you simply have to, uh, for let's say for a UV system, uh, determine what the single pass in activation is. And that's easy to uh, add on to your existing filter in, in series. Thank you. Our, our second question by uh, Mr. Mark Lowry. Are there any scientific controlled studies taking place to evaluate the efficacy of bipolar ionization, particularly in relation to ASHRAE recognized efficacy of UV airstream treatment? Um, well, ASHRAE does not have any new startup research projects. I'm aware of, of several efforts to uh, do that kind of evaluation on bipolar ionization systems. And there's also uh, a lot of interest, more interest than in the past in, in finally developing standards for testing those devices. So that's a very active discussion in ASHRAE. Unfortunately, as anyone who's familiar with standards knows, it's, it's the work usually of several years to develop a standard from uh, title, purpose, and scope to actual published standard. Excellent. Thank you. Third question. Um, or it relates to a hot and arid climate region. So how to best balance energy efficiency and indoor air quality? Yeah, well, you know, I think the, uh, to me, the, the future of, of uh, really good IEQ is going to be alternatives to ventilation. Uh, for the ventilation that you do utilize, have good uh, total energy recovery, you know, hot air climate, you don't want to be wasting uh, indoor moisture to the outside and you don't want to pay too much based on the sensible component, but uh, don't rely on outdoor air for everything. If we can uh, characterize air cleaners so that we can use them effectively, then we won't have to uh, increase ventilation as the, the only solution. I think one more reason to balance efficiency and air quality uh, is better demand controlled ventilation. I think we can, um, with uh, future sensor development and more spatially as well as temporally uh, regulated demand control, uh, try to zero in on providing good air quality where there are actually occupants in a building and not wasting energy on providing it where there isn't uh, occupancy. Excellent. Um, next question. Is displacement ventilation preferred over mixing ventilation in response to COVID-19? Probably not for existing buildings, but what about new buildings, especially for places or spaces with high ceilings? Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I think that there are a lot of air distribution issues that, that need to be looked at, but, you know, to go back to the slide that I showed earlier, um, in, in a, a, a a space with say normal ceiling height, the effect of displacement versus um, mixing has been studied and uh, they, they found that there was a lot of potential with, with uh, displacement to create high concentrations of uh, trapped exhaled aerosol because the, uh, when the contaminants coming from exhalation, it escapes the thermal plume of the person, doesn't get carried upward like other contaminants do, and it could, could just hang in the air. That, that's a really interesting article to read if you haven't seen it. Um, but I think uh, high, tall spaces and uh, uh, pushing contaminants up out of occupied zone is, is a good thing to do. Whether that takes strat uh, stratification in the occupied region is, is maybe a different issue. But, uh, we have a, a, a team that's working on that right now as we recognize that that's an important uh, unanswered question. Excellent. I think I have time for two more questions. Um, next one, I'm wondering if the presenter could elaborate on the types of controls that could be instituted to reduce energy use through mechanical ventilation. Thank you. Um, Sure. Well, you have to think very 
broadly, if, if we um, have uh, just to say a VAV system, an all, all air system, obviously the, the place to start is with good uh, air to air uh, energy recovery on the, the outdoor air intake. Um, but you could go from, a, in many climates, from a VAV system to a dedicated outdoor air system, and you could bring in the same amount of outdoor air, and you wouldn't have to um, take a penalty for having a, a multiple space system, and you could deliver the uh, design ventilation all the time. Those systems uh, in climates where economizer operation doesn't dominate can and uh, operate at a lot lower uh, level of energy use. And, and the, the other factor I already mentioned is demand is uh, demand controlled ventilation. We could use that more effectively to provide higher levels of air quality when there is occupancy and uh, save more energy when there isn't. Excellent. Just last question. What is the anticipated relationship between CO2 and ventilation effectiveness? CO2 and ventilation effectiveness. And um, it, well, just CO2 and ventilation is, is a difficult issue. I, I think that uh, um, many have, have suggested that, that CO2 concentration can be used to determine whether uh, there's a good level of infection risk control in a space. And I don't really understand it because um, CO2 is generated by every person in a space. And you could have 100 people in a space and one's infected and you'll have one value of CO2 concentration there. And if half of them go away, the, the CO2 concentration is gonna be 50% of what it was before. But if the infected person is still there, you have the same amount of dilution, uh, but a much lower CO2 concentration. So you have the same risk. I, I have not yet seen the uh, logic in in uh, the recommendations that are being made. The, the only way that they make sense is if the view of risk is a public health uh, approach. So that if, if what you're looking at is not what is my risk of being infected, but what is the number of people who are likely to be infected, then the CO2 concentration is important as has been shown in uh, some work by Rudnick and, and Milton. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Banfleth. And I'm afraid that's all we have time for today in terms of Q&A. Um, as mentioned, the recording and slides will be made available of today's presentation. And if you would like to dive deeper into today's topics, we encourage you to visit the resources listed here. We hope you will join us for the next webinar in this series, The Entry Impacts of COVID-19 HVAC Mitigation Strategies. Chris Caradonna and Kim Trenbath from NREL will discuss the energy implications of 100% outdoor air ventilation rates, installing MERV 13 filters, disabling demand control ventilation, and HVAC flushing mode operation. The registration link will be available on the COVID-19 Resource Center. And speaking of, we do encourage you to visit our newly re renovated COVID-19 Resource Center. Here you can learn from the experts with resources from ASHRAE, the EPA, DOE, and more. View resources by technology type and watch webinars or register for upcoming virtual learning opportunities. And with that, I'd like to thank Dr. Banfleth and Marcus Bianchi very much for taking the time to be with us today. Feel free to contact us directly with additional questions, or if we couldn't get to your question during our Q&A period, our team is happy to connect you with our experts to get all of those questions answered. And I encourage you to follow the Better Buildings Initiative on Twitter for all the latest news. And thanks to everyone for being here today. Thank you, Mariana, glad to be with you. Thank you. Thank you.